All right, children, you are dismissed. Please, you are dismissed. But you'll learn a lot from these kids. I learned this morning from our neighbor, Minnie, here that you can baptize rabbits. Huh? Stuffed rabbits. Stuff rabbit. She had a six foot rabbit back here in a baptism. Interesting to see. Huh? You can baptize chickens. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but that speaks volumes to me. I mean, that shows you what's important to a child. I mean, of all my years in ministry, that, that went right over my head. Who would think of baptizing a chicken or a stuffed rabbit like that? That was just so important to her. And it really, it shows you too that understanding the significance, well, at least you might not understand the significance, but you understand the importance of it at least, that you would want you know, something or someone dear to you that you want to baptize them. You understand that it's important. So before we get started to reached out to some people last week who I know own a MacArthur study Bible, Caitlin, and a couple others, you know. Now, I love John MacArthur, but that's one of those texts, one of the only you'll ever find where Mr. MacArthur and me in this church don't agree. You know, we'll part company on this. You know, he says in his study Bible, well, you don't ever have to worry or concern yourself about the tribulation or what happens then because that does not concern you. And I don't agree with that. You know, the Lord, uh, Peter asked the Lord, he said, are you speaking to us or are you speaking to, he says, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So those are my words and instructions to you. He tells us all to watch. There is no escape hatch. I don't believe that. That's why we part company there. Like I said, there's very, very few places where we might part company. Dare we try this again, sound man? Are you ready? Boop, 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 boop. How's that? Does anyone need a handout for today? I probably should have taken up this offering after this sermon. Never fear, you still can make an offering afterwards. If you need one of these, raise your hand. We'll make sure that you get it. The parable of the talents. Everyone's got one. No one needs it. The all new and improved parable of the talents. New, I hope so, because I've preached this thing ten times. Improved, Lord, it better be improved. I better know God and his word better now than when I first wrote this sermon. And it is improved. Because it hurts me more now than it ever hurt me in the past. So I know it's improved. Let's pray before we get started any further. Lord, we pray right now for the effectiveness of your word. And we know your word is effective. It cuts like a knife. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide my soul and spirit and divide the marrow from inside of its bones. Lord, we pray you would do that with us now. We listen for your voice. Speak to us where we know that you speak through your word. Help us to be doers of your word and not just hearers as well. Because we deceive ourselves when we hear and don't do. Minister to us. And May the power to change be present as well, Lord. As you show us what may be one thing we lack, may the power to change be present so that we can make it right here today, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. No matter how many times I've preached it, the message is still the same, and that is, you will be judged by your works. Notice I didn't say you're saved by your works. I said you will be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ by your works. Now the Apostle James wrote this to encourage you in his own special way. He said in James 2.17, he said even though faith, if it doesn't have works, 
is dead, being by itself or being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. Also, verse 26 of that chapter there, James 2.26, it says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, on the other extreme is why the whole notion of works gets such a bad rep. Unfortunately, the Catholic Church. I heard the Pope say not too long ago that atheists will get into heaven because of their good works. Don't believe that for a minute. If I say it, or, or anyone else, there's only one way to get into heaven, and that is through the person and the name of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. You can't buy your way there. So what does the Bible say? Now, this from the New American Standard, 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home, that means in heaven, or absent, or absent, absent from the body, that is. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. He, go, uh, he continues, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. See, knowing the fear of the Lord, he says, we persuade men, meaning knowing what's in store for us coming up. You see, he's been to the other side. He knows what's awaiting man. He says, knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, knowing therefore that this is real, we persuade men. What he's saying is true. He's a witness. All these apostles were eyewitnesses. They've seen the face of the Lord. The Apostle Paul's been to the third heaven. He wasn't allowed to tell you what's there. But he says, knowing therefore that you and I are going to be accountable for what we're doing here with what he's given us, we persuade men. And this absolutely goes right along with today's parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14. Let's turn there. Matthew 25, 14. We've been in this series here, famous chapters of the Bible. We're in chapter 25. Next week, my sermon's on climate change. Don't miss it. All these yakkers want to yak about climate change. What does the Bible say about it? That'll be next week. Matthew 25, verse 14. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like, of all the things a person could imagine or think when they hear the Lord Jesus Christ start off a parable like that. The kingdom of heaven is like. What on earth shall he compare the kingdom of heaven to? Now let's find out. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. All right, so the kingdom of heaven is the Lord Jesus going away to a far country. And he's about to go away for a long, long time. True that so far, right? Who called his own servants and, and delivered to them his goods. So that's Jesus' stuff. Is what this is. It's his own goods. It's his stuff. His stuff that's of value to him. It's not just money. It's his stuff. His goods. So he called his own servants and delivered to them his goods. Now to the one, this is verse 15. To the one he gave five talents. To another, two. And to another, one to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went away on a journey. So that's where we're at here today. No one is handicapped. No one is better than someone else. Everyone starts out the same. No one is mis mismatched with the wrong gift or ability. 
He doesn't give Pastor Darren a tuba. Even though that would be an interesting sight. Boom, 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 boom. Everyone's been given talents. Talents of Jesus' stuff. It's not just money. It's his stuff, his goods, whatever that may be. Whatever he owns. It's funny, he says he owns it all. That's of value to him. He's given to us and he's gone away for a long time. And of course, also talents is a unit of measure in the Bible. For the most part, 75 pounds. So the point of this parable is twofold. Number one, while the Lord Jesus is away, you are to do something. That is kingdom work. Work faithfully and diligently. Number two, while Jesus is away, you are to know something. Your work will be greatly rewarded or greatly judged depending on what you do or don't do with it. Ephesians 4 and 8, it says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. The Lord Jesus has given you something. He's given you of his own goods. Something perfect and powerful and holy. Remember, holy means set apart for special use. You've heard it before. So-and-so is very talented. Even a play on words, we can apply this. It doesn't matter whether it's the piano, the guitar. Maybe you're a talented singer or songwriter. Or you're just a plain writer. Now, Tim Tebow, with John 3.16 written on his face in a football game. You see, he used a God-given talent to be a quarterback, and he used that talent for the glory of God. You say, what does playing football have to do with serving the Lord? You know, when he did that seemingly innocent enough thing that shattered all the records on Google, believe it or not, like a child baptizing a rabbit way over my head, you see, I had no idea that I would figure everyone would know John 3.16. It was the number one Google, the thing ever used in the Google search engine is what on earth is John 3.16. See, it's not just money. It's using the ability or using what God's given you for his glory that could change from day to day no matter what it may be. Using what God's given you for his glory. Whether it's John 3.16 on the black under the eyes or Glenda Hale in here playing a piano. The Bible says this, Colossians 3.17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, when David conquered a particular king, we read this, 1 Chronicles 20. It says, Then David took the king's crown from his head, and he found it to weigh a talent of gold. And there were precious stones on it, and it was set on David's head. You also could read 1 Kings 20, 39. The book of Revelation mentions a talent as well. Revelation 16, 21. It says, Great hail, great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone weighing about a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Imagine that, a hailstone weighing a talent. Now King Solomon had lots of talents. We read 1 Kings 10.14, The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. Wow, ask Siri how much that is. Here's a definition of talent I read in a Hebrew encyclopedia. A Greek talent was 57 pounds. A Roman one was 71 pounds. An Egyptian talent was 60 pounds. A Babylonian talent was 67 pounds. And it was here that the Jewish talent got its measurement from, though it was changed later. The heavy common talent used in New Testament times 
was 59 kilograms or 130 pounds. So can you imagine a 130 pound block of ice falling out of heaven and what that would look like? I'd rather have it raining cats and dogs. I'd rather be hit on the head by a schnauzer or a Jack Russell. Sorry, Jim, I know you got a whole house load of them. I'll take that over a 130 pound block of ice on my forehead any time. Now, back from the top, the kingdom of heaven is like, what's it like? The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each one according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. All right, so everyone's received something. The Lord Jesus is perfect in what he distributes. Now let me stop for a minute and let me make this personal. This is what I've learned this week. First James says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Meditate on that. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. Now many of you know here that I have inherited money personally from both of my parents who both happened to die within a year of each other or year and a half and I'm not poor like I have been for most of my adult life and I love to give away money and Bibles and stuff I love giving away stuff but just this last week preparing for this sermon I've come to realize that my inheritance is part of of the good and perfect gifts that I have received. You see, in the past, I've separated them. Well, there's this money, and there's this stuff over here, and then over here, you see, there's my inheritance way over here, and God says, oh, 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 oh. No, you don't, Smedley. These two belong together. Can't separate the two. Your inheritance is a good, and sorry if I hurt your ears on that one, your inheritance is a good and perfect gift that's come down from above, you see. And now my eyes are open. You can't treat the two different. I'm going to be accountable for what I do with the money that I have inherited from my mother and father who have passed away. And God loves a cheerful giver. My personal attitude concerning all this and it's always been this for a long time. It's not this week. And that is how much good can I do out here today? Like a little Ebenezer Scrooge. He's one of my heroes. At least the Christmas morn Ebenezer Scrooge. I understand that man better than anyone. You see, I've been given a new lease on life. And I wake up and say, what can I do out here today? How can I be a blessing to others? That's what he's looking for. Because I'm going to give an account of what I do with what he's given me. Whether it's a Bible translator and translate in the Bible. Or whether it's being able to understand his word and preach. Or it's what I do with the finance. I can't separate the money from anything else. It's all together. He says, everything under heaven, God said to Job, everything under heaven belongs right to me, God says. He owns it all. Everything that you have, he owns. And he's been good to you. He's been good to me. Now, for me personally, my ability has changed throughout the years. It's different now. Now that I'm 61 years old, it's different now than it was when I was in my 20s. So put yourself in the place of these three people 
who have received something from the Lord that was of value to bless and advance his kingdom. Now the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 10, 8, he says, freely you have received. Freely give. Freely give. Verse 6, sometimes that's how it feels like to give. <laughs> That's why he says, I pray that your intestines aren't constrained or straightened. <laughs> Not now, Lord. Verse 16. Then he would receive the five talents. He went and traded with them. And he made five other talents. Likewise, he who would receive the two gained two more also. All right, so what's the equivalent of doing these things today? I would guess the first two opened up some kind of business or a ministry. Around here, what, the, what would that look like? First Baptist Church of Merritt Island on a Monday morning. Drive by the parking lot of that place on a Monday. It's the most incredible scene you've ever seen. With a C. They do it all. People come from all over this county. The Brevard Sharing Center. The Red Cross. Catholic Charities. A wonderful organization. Or how about this? East Coast Christian Center. Let me blow their horn for them. East Coast Christian Center. Uses the talents they have received. To feed everyone in the entire county. Anyone who has need can go to East Coast Christian Center on a Tuesday morning and you will leave with food. That's what it looks like. Or how about this? Island Community Church. Island feeds the hungry every other Saturday morning. Isn't it a blessing to serve? When people come in here with a tear in their eyes, some people that don't have anything and you share with them the love of Jesus Christ and food, spiritual help, prayers, kindness. Also, the church pays a portion of my radio bill. Now, that costs us, well, it's $1,000 a month. The church pays a, a portion of that. That spreads the gospel. It puts these messages. This message will be heard. Now Danny back there running the sound is the station manager there. This will go out Tuesday and Wednesday on the radio. Now before that, the church was sponsoring Bill Steinbrook, who's not here, who was a missionary in Israel. We helped to support him. He, in turn, took that money and he paid it forward. Shared it with Arab Christians, a group so desperately in need. Everyone hated the Arab Christians. Gypsy Christians, even in Poland and Ukraine, Bill drove practically through enemy lines in Ukraine to bring food and other stuff to hungry and needy people. And in, in addition to that, in addition to Bill, who I can say it, it's not here for me to embarrass him, Bill spent every cent that he had. Bill is one of those one of those people that actually took God at his word? Imagine that. He went out, he sold his, sold his car. We bought his television. He sold everything that he had and went to Israel. We supported him. This was a, this big circle of stuff. Doing what we can with what the Lord's given to us. That's what this looks like. That's what this looks like. Those talents came from you, the people of this church. You guys paid it forward. Now the Lord Jesus will say at the end of this parable, and as much as you've done this to the least of these, my brethren... You have done it to me, he says. You might not see it right now, but you're serving him. You're serving him. Church, God does great things with what you give. 
Paul wrote, this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Greek word there is hilarion. God loves a hilarious giver where the left hand doesn't even know what the right hand's doing. You just give it away. Give it up. Give up your money. Give of your time. Give of your love. If you're down or depressed, do something for someone else. If you're down or depressed, go and do something. Serve somebody. Do something for someone else. Then listen to this verse, this next verse. Verse 8, it says, God is able... To make all grace abound towards you. That you always have an all sufficiency in all things. May have an abundance for every good work. See I believe that this church is not going to run out of money. When we match the donations that were put in that offering plate today. He's in the blessing business. And the multiplying business. This is what he does. You can't out give God. Okay, we've seen two people give. How about he who does nothing? We'll see in a moment what happens to the entrusted servant who does nothing. Verse 18, but he who received one, he went and dug into the ground. Boy, can't you just see the shovel? You know, I love watching these old Frankenstein movies. You always see Dr. Frankenstein. He's never out in the daylight. He's always out in the dark. So this cat had a shovel. And he went out and he did himself a little bit of digging. And I, I warranty it, he did it at night. <laughs> he who received one talent, he went and he dug into the ground. He dug it up into the ground and he hid his Lord's money. There you have it. We see this guy, he underestimated his Lord. And he underestimated the cost. He underestimated his Lord or his master because he was going to be, he, like you, are going to be accountable for what you do with what God's given you. And he underestimated the cost because this guy is going to suffer a violent death for what he did or for what he didn't do. There you have it. There's two types of Christians in this world, all given something by our Lord, a particular talent to serve the master. As a bondservant, which you are, by the way, you are indeed a servant to someone. You're serve some, you either serve yourself or you serve him. There's no option three. I guess you really could say you either serve the devil or you serve God, right? I mean, the Greek word for I, you remember what it is? ego so let me ask the question what talents has the Lord given you remember every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights and number two what are you doing with his talents not yours don't kid yourself they're not yours they're his He's entrusted them to you. What are you doing with his talents? Again, you heard what he said to Job. Everything under heaven belongs to me. And he's coming back soon to settle accounts. What have you done with what he's given you? If you're uncertain about question number one, allow me to help you along. What is it that you could do effortlessly and tirelessly around the clock that you don't even consider work that would be considered kingdom work. What could you do? What could you do that would so engross you that someone would have to elbow you in the ribs and say, look at the time. Or for you to answer, where is the day gone? 
Because your talents is more than money. Some people don't have money. It's the master's stuff. He's given you his stuff. It's not all, it's not about money, but it certainly includes money. For me, another talent, or perhaps it's an addiction, is an all-consuming passion for the Word of God. It's this book right here. I'm addicted to it. I can't get enough. Ask my wife. I probably have 400 of these now. And they all smell lovely. And God says, you can collect all you want. Guess what? As long as you do what's written on the inside of them, then go ahead and collect them. And give them away. Now, I love to give away Bibles in case you have not noticed. I love to do that. I'm consumed with this book. And you people here, you either reap the benefits, if there's any, or you suffer the consequences. But I ask the question, how about you? What is it that you could do around the clock and never get tired that would exalt the Savior and advance his kingdom? What is it? Sometimes it could be as simple as a John 3.16 under your eyes. Now let's look at the Lord's responses to all three of these individuals who were given talents. Verse 19. Now after a long time, the Lord, or master of these servants, he came and he settled accounts with them. See, after a long time, the Lord of these here servants is coming back soon and he's going to hold court with us. And he's going to inquire of each of us as to what we've done. Once again, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear. That's like a summons that you get in the mail. Or a draft notice. Greetings. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. All right, now, verse 20. So he had received the five talents. He came and he brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, or the King James has, behold, I love that word, meaning, check this out. Man, it's like a kid waiting for your dad to come home, pulling up that driveway, or your mother, or your school teacher, and you've done something great, and you can't wait for your mother to get home, or your father, and you say, look at this. Catch the attitude here. Man, this guy's excited. Behold, I love that's probably my favorite word in the Bible. Is behold. Check this out, he's saying. Behold, I've gained five more talents. And his Lord said to him, verse 21, well done. These are words that you want to hear, by the way, after you leave this world. Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 22, now he also who had received the two talents, he came and said, Lord, you deliver to me two talents. Behold! I've gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Notice please the equal commendation to both servants. Even though one of them was given more than the other one had. That didn't matter to the master. Hear me now. What's required of stewards is that a man be found faithful. What's required of stewards is that a man or a woman be found faithful. So what talent do you have? Some people have the money to build a special wing at a hospital. 
while others have the talent to crochet a bunny or a teddy bear and bring it to the child that's in the hospital that the guy with all the money had to build it. They're each going to get equal commendation. One who got out and knitted the bunny and the other one that spent a couple million dollars building it. They're both praised the same. He's given to each one of us according to our ability. Whether you're rich or what you might consider to be poor, poor in your opinion perhaps, but not his. That's not how he views you. That's not how he views you. Verse 24, and it's day of reckoning for Sid the Sloth. Or better yet, I like to call this guy now, I call him Morocco Mole. Remember that cartoon the, with the Peter Lorre, the Morocco Mole? Even moles wear hats. Verse 24, so he who received the one talent, he came and said, Lord, he said, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown. The gathering where you had not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. There you go. That's what's yours. Go ahead, take it. It's like he flipped them a quarter. Like God was some kind of cosmic bellhop or something. Boy, catch just the smugness of his attitude. Look, you've got what is yours. He who received the one talent said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathered where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there it is. You have what is yours. Notice the attitude of this last man. First of all, he's a liar, he wasn't afraid. Because if he was afraid, he would have worked out of fear and he would have made more than everyone else had combined. When people do things out of fear, he wasn't afraid. He did it all. He would have done it all for all the wrong reasons. Second of all, he was lazy. Thirdly, he seemed to have this disdain for his master. Catch the attitude here. Look. You've got what is yours. It's under the ground over there somewhere. Now we're about to see this heart condition will bring forth a violent death. Verse 26. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to put my money over here in the belly, savings and loan. What show is that? What's a wonderful life? <laughs> you should have put my money in the bank, he says. At least. And he wouldn't have even been condemned if he just brought it down here to Bank of America and put it in there. So he is talking about money here as well. You ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming... I would have received back my own with interest. So, take the talent from him and give it to the one that's got ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this is utter anguish because you've been thrown out. You buried your talent and you got tossed, to put nicely and politely. And yet I ponder those words that started this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like Now, in this case of this third individual, because of your attitude toward God and toward your servants for your master is one of disdain, this person was shown the door to put nicely, cast in outer darkness to put more accurately. Not the place you want to be. Not the place that you want to be found. 
Even the Apostle Paul prayed that I would be found in him, not having my own righteousness. This is not where you want to be found. Where the Lord's given you stuff, he's given you of his own goods, and he says, you go out here and do business until I come. And when I come back, we're going to settle accounts. What have you done with what the master has given to you? That's my question. So we've seen today the consequences of two attitudes towards serving the Lord Jesus Christ while he is away. The one who diligently prepares for it by investing their time and talents to serve God will be rewarded. The one who has no heart for the work of the kingdom will be punished. So hear me now. God rewards faithfulness. God rewards faithfulness. Those who bear no fruit for God's kingdom cannot expect to be treated the same way as those who are faithful. Let me say that again. Those who bear no fruit for God's kingdom cannot expect to be treated the same way as those who are faithful. So let me encourage you today, church. Let's be about the kingdom business until he returns. And always remember, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. That's James 1.17. And lastly, this verse the Lord gave me this morning, getting ready for this. It's Matthew 6.19. It's not up there. Let me read it to you. The Lord Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you in the house here today. Lord, you've been so good to us. Forgive us for, for dropping the ball. Forgive us for not being about your work. Forgive us for thinking or not recognizing the things that you've given us. When the truth of the matter is, every good gift that we have has come from you. And you own it all. So we pray here right now this morning. We confess this trespass to you this morning we leave it here behind our lord jesus didn't die for nothing and he didn't die in vain we repent of this sin we pray that we pray your word back to you that you would as we confess this this morning you would remember it no more like you promised lord forgive us for missing the mark here for falling short of your glory here and what you have established for us and we pray that we indeed would wake up like Mr. Dickens' Ebenezer Scrooge. And we'd open our eyes here this morning, like Christmas morn. And we'd have a new found joy of what you've done for us. So we want to return like the leper. The one leper who returned to give you glory. We come to you, Lord. We return to you. And we say, Lord, what shall we do? Show us how we can serve you. Put us to work here, advancing your kingdom here in these end of days, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.